Three hours ago, up and down the eastern seaboard, storytellers stood up in front of audiences just like this and started their stories. Two hours ago, from Chicago down the Central Standard Time, they started again. And then they rolled into the west of the, the, the mountain states. And now, here we are on the Pacific Coast, where tellers just like these are telling up and down the coast. And an hour from now, into the Pacific and on around the world. It, Telebration started in 1988 in a small town in the East Coast, and it now goes into countries around the world, over 40 states. There is tonight a river of stories circling the globe. I love to tell stories. I love to listen to stories. I started loving stories early in my life, but really got into stories when I lived at the coast. And at the coast, about uh, 12 years ago, I went to a program called Stories by the Sea. And I went just like you've come tonight, to an evening show with storytellers telling stories. And I, as I sat and listened, I just thought, that's so wonderful, that's so amazing. I could do that. <laughs> so it's a real pleasure to me that tonight our four storytellers, Rick Huddle, Alton Chung, Will Horniak, and Anne Louise Sterry, I met at Stories by the Sea pretty much that first year that I was visiting. And when I first started telling stories, when I got brave enough to actually get up in front of people and tell a story. They were there to encourage me and to help me. And that's what storytellers are like. It is a community of people who care about each other, who are friendly, who are nurturing. Now, Rick Huddle, he is a man who is very, very generous and almost childlike in his approach to the world. Now, he comes by that naturally because his mother is a clown. And that is the truth. And I think you will find that generosity and love of childhood adventure in the stories you are going to hear from Rick. And with no further ado, Rick Huddle. My wife and I, we went down to Oaxaca, Mexico, a few years ago for this uh, writing workshop. And uh, if you don't know, Oaxaca, it's, a, it's this really artsy colonial town down in the mountains of Mexico. It's known for the alabrijes, those little uh, wooden fantastical creatures that are brightly colored. And some of the most famous uh, modern Mexican painters are, are from Oaxaca. But it's not so much known for its performance, and uh, both of us are performers, and uh, so when we saw this sign one day uh, that said Teatro, we were really interested. And it didn't have many details about it, it just had a date, a time, and a location. So it happened to be that night, and uh, as we left our hotel, we walked down these uh, cobblestone streets. We got to this huge concrete building, and it had a, a wooden door that was maybe 10 or 12 feet tall. And it, was, it looked like it was some sort of a government or a public building. The door was open, um, as many of them are. And, uh, and, and so we walked in and led to this big stone courtyard. It was open to the sky, and, uh, but there was nothing going on there. And we walked around, we asked the security guard, and he didn't know anything about it. So we started like poking it, and there was uh, rooms all along the outside of this big courtyard. So we started kind of poking our heads in. And we saw uh, these five guys, they were, um, they were college age uh, men, and they were all gathered around this large wooden table. So we kind of poked our head in, and, and you know, in as much Spanish as we could figure out, we said something about, uh, 
obra de teatro, and, uh, and they looked at us, and they said, si, si, aquí, si, si. So we walked in, and we sat down at this wooden table, and it turned out that the, there wasn't a performance that night, that it was, uh, a, a, uh, it was this new group, this was their second night of meeting, and they were trying to start this theatrical group. Yeah. <laughs> Um, now, uh, uh, most of them uh, had English skills that were only slightly better than uh, my Spanish skills. Um, <laughs> but luckily, this one guy, Jaime, he, he was uh, fluent in both. And so he translated for us all back and forth. And Jaime was really passionate about theater. It was so exciting to be around him. And uh, he said how uh, they were really excited to, to create new work. And, uh, you know, as great as the work of Shakespeare was and everything, but they wanted to create stuff that really the common people can connect to. And uh, they wanted to use improvisation to create these new works. Well, both my wife and I uh, have studied improvisation. I've uh, taken a lot of... Um, classes and kind of uh, traditional improv where we play games and we create these scenes, you know, about construction workers or cops or, or whatever. And my wife, Kristen, she has done this kind of weird improv. Uh, it's, it's like all sound and, and movement based and they, they will stand there for a long time and go, uh, 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 It gets them somewhere. Uh. <laughs> So, so we told them about our experiences, and, uh, and they're like, that's great, that's great. And, uh, and so Jaime, he goes, uh, ¿Quieren jugar? Do you want to play? And um, now one of the tenets, one of the mantras of improvisation is to always say yes. So we did as we were told and, and, and trained, and we said yes. And uh, Jaime led us into the big stone courtyard there. Now, uh, one of the things that I really appreciate about my wife and that also scares me a lot <laughs> is her, her willingness to like jump in with both feet. And uh, she did, you know, here we are, we're in Mexico, we don't really know the language and uh, we're, we're kind of crashing this uh, workshop and she says, well, I have a game. <laughs> and she did, it was perfect too. We got in this big circle and uh, we passed around sound and motion. So somebody would go whoosh and the other person would whoosh, pata, pata, zing, zing, you know, and just kept passing around these different things. It was weird, but it was perfect. It was, it was, it was a really good icebreaker and, and no communication uh, breakdowns there. So, um, so then Jaime, he, he grabbed this box of uh, props and there were a lot of um, electronic things from the house, like uh, there's a little tiny electric fan and uh, the, the handset for a phone and some cords and stuff like that. So he brought out this box and he asked each of us to pick one item and then partner up with one other person. So, uh, so I, I grabbed a remote control and I partnered with one of the uh, college students. And he, uh, he had this really kind of serious look on his face, deep, uh, dark brown eyes. And we faced each other, and Jaime asked us to just look into our partner's eyes for two minutes. Yeah. No, not saying anything, not trying to communicate, not smiling, just looking. It was super intimate <laughs> and scary. Like, I don't think I've ever done that with my wife, you know, much less some guy from Oaxaca. So, um, so then Jaime asked us to, uh, to interact with our partner, to kind of move around in space and interact with our partner. No words again, but, uh, but use the props that we had. So uh, my partner and I, we started kind of walking around, and I had this remote, so I was like, oh. And it made me think of uh, one of the games that I had learned was uh, called Puppet and Puppet Master, you know, where one person controls the other. And I was like, ah, I have a remote control, so this will be great. So I, you know, zapped him, and he just kept moving. <laughs> Zap. <laughs> Zap. And I started to get, you know, kind of frustrated. I was like, does this guy not get it? 
you know, or well, what, why isn't he doing? I mean, this seems pretty obvious to me, you know, what I'm trying to get him to do. And he, uh, but he, he wouldn't respond. And, and finally he took uh, this cord, he had like a telephone cord, and he wrapped around my arm and he kind of pulled me. And at first I was like, well, you, know, I didn't, you didn't play when I was playing. <laughs> And I was like, all right, all right, fine. So I let him kind of move me around a little bit. And then he wrapped me up in the cord. And he, uh, he took the, rem- the remote and tied the other end of the cord to the remote, put it in my hand, and pointed it at me and had me, like, click. I was like, all right. You know, and I just kept doing these weird things. Well, Jaime called time. And uh, we all went back into the uh, meeting room where we had first started. We sat down at at that wooden table and kind of debriefed everything. Well, my partner, he told told me and and everybody there through Jaime that uh, he was a little resistant at first. And I was like, oh. (laughs) And, uh, And he said, well, I was resistant because I felt like this, uh, you know, here, this, here you are, this American, you came down here and you tried to control me. Yeah. And so I decided to wrap you up in, in that electrical cord um, and, and have you have the, the cord control you. Like uh, a lot of Americans get wrapped up in all their electronics and, they're so, and they let them control their lives. I know, right? Like way, I mean, I was way down here. So I, uh, I uh, you know, I explained like, well, I was just uh, trying to play. <laughs> and I told him about the puppet, puppet master game and, and uh, you know, I didn't mean anything by it. And I saw his face, you know, as Jaime was explaining it to him, it, it, the, 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 the coldness kind of melted away, and, and he understood, and he was like, oh. <laughs> and I left, and I think we, we both left there with, with a, like a deeper appreciation, not only of the arts, but, but specifically of improvisation. You know, they say that the arts can kind of bring about about greater understanding of people. And uh, while that didn't exactly happen when we were, you know, were <laughs> actually pr- practicing the art, that we both stuck uh, with it because of our love of, of that art form. Uh, we left with this deeper understanding, not only of our, our personal baggage, but our cultural baggage that we bring with us wherever we go. Thank you. Well, when I was in uh, high school, I was um, pretty shy and pretty insecure, like a lot of uh, kids, I suppose. And, um, you know, some kids want to be like the coolest or the best athlete or the funniest, the smartest. I just wanted to be normal, you know, (laughs) just be like everybody else. And those insecurities uh, crop up and, and show themselves in different ways. For me, it, it showed up in my pants. <laughs> Not like that. <laughs> it showed up in the jeans that I wore. It started this, this day, uh, I was riding the bus, and these two older girls were sitting in front of me. And I overheard them. Uh, the, the one girl said, he showed up to pick me up in a pair of Lee's. He wore Lee's on a date. I told him we are turning right around and you were going to go home and you were going to put on some Levi's. I had no idea. I had three pairs of jeans to my name. Two of them were Lee's and one pair of Levi's. (laughs) Now, I, I wasn't dating anybody at the time. I didn't date anybody pretty much throughout high school because of my shyness. But uh, I decided right then and there I was always going to wear Levi's, you know, so if I ever did pick up somebody on a date, I was not going to end up like that poor sucker. <laughs> well, um, I, uh, 
I was the uh, editor of my high school paper, and uh, this one day we were sitting around. Uh, I, I, so I, I started to wear these same pair of Levi's every single day, everywhere, every single day. And uh, this one day in the newspaper room, we were sitting around, we were kind of brainstorming ideas for Kim Snyder uh, for her next article. Kim uh, was, uh, she was uh, really pretty. She was a cheerleader, a little nose, big hair, and, uh, and smart, too. And, and she had always been really nice to me, so I really liked Kim. And Kim usually wrote about fashion articles, you know, uh, uh, Miami Vice was big, so everybody was wearing pastels and those T-shirts with a jacket over them, and, and parachute pants were big, with the zippers, and uh, so she wrote articles on stuff like that. And we were sitting there uh, throwing out ideas, and Kim says, uh, well, I could write about how our editor wears the same pair of pants every day. <laughs> I was like, oh, man. She kn- Wait, if she knows, obviously all these other people know right now too, but maybe everybody in the whole school knows. And, and so, I mean, even if I'm not dating anybody now, my chances are dashed, <laughs> right? Not only am I kind of weird because I wear the same pair of pants every day, but that means I'm, I'm gross too. I mean, I can't wash those things every single day. So uh, Kim, she saw this look of horror on my face <laughs> And, uh, and she said, oh, oh, I'm just kidding, Ricky. I mean, I just saw you wearing the same pair as yesterday, and I mean, I do that all the time. Trying to let me off the hook. But I knew, I knew that she knew, and I knew I had to do something. But I still was not going to wear my Lees. <laughs> I suppose I could have asked my parents, you know, to get me another pair of jeans or something, um, but then that meant I would have to explain the reason was that, you know, I might want to go out on a date at some point, which might lead to that discussion about sex, and I did not want to go anywhere near that discussion. So I was just going to suffer through with this one pair of Levi's. <laughs> but I had to do something, so I decided, okay, I can wear them two days in a row, so I can wear them on Monday and Tuesday and Thursday and Friday. I just need to split up the week, and I'll wear, like, my khakis or something. But then I thought, well, if I always wear the khakis on Wednesday, people start calling me khaki Wednesday boy or something like that. So I need a more complex algorithm. So on the second or third week, I'll wear them on Tuesdays or on Thursdays, and then I have to wear them three days in a row, row the regular jeans, but it'll work out. I knew, I know, I know, it'll be fine. <laughs> the irony is that, you know... Through all that, I, I, I didn't realize that in my desire to fit in, that I was standing out. <laughs> and in my desire to be normal, I was acting like a freak. I cannot count the number of times that I have told people I'm a storyteller, and they say, oh, do you know Will Horniak? <laughs> How many people here know Will Horniak? Raise your hands, raise your hands. But I'm here to tell you, you don't know the real Will Horniak. I, I can tell you more about Will, and actually, he gave me a written statement to read about him. Normally, I've got to tell you, storytellers never read. They always tell, but Will insisted. He insisted. And when Will Horniak insists, you must comply. <laughs> so here it goes. This is the truth about Will Horniak. The youngest child of a family of Irish tinkers, William Kennedy Horniak, what a name, huh? was born in a mud and wattle hut. <laughs> and listened to stories because, oh no, beside, a peat fire at the knee of his great-grandfather, William Butler Yeats. <laughs> it's the truth. Telling stories at crossroads and marketplaces, Will plied his trade in obscurity until winning the Nobel Prize for oral literature in 1985. You can find that on Wikipedia.
<laughs> oh, he can't write, though. <laughs> Will lives some of the time in Milwaukee, but most of the time in his imagination, <laughs> where he refuses to let facts obscure a good story. Ladies and gentlemen, Will Hornet. How you doing? Good. Wow, what a good crowd. Thanks for coming out tonight. Um, I thought I'd start with a, uh, a tale from Scotland. Uh, there's a saying uh, in Scotland and Ireland, uh, no sun, no light, no heat, no warmth, November. Right? <laughs> and it's sort of the month of, of death, really. And, um, but, the, but the interesting thing is, of course, is that as the outer world seems to die, the inner life, the life of the imagination, really comes to life, because it is a time for, for storytelling. And this is a story from Scotland. And they say that... Um, there are in the land places that are called thin places, uh, places where the veil that separates the living from the dead, this world from the other world, it's so thin you can feel those places. And some people call such places haunted places. Some would call them holy places. Some would call them terrifying. Some would call them magical. But though people disagree about what to call such places, just about everybody agrees that they are places in which one should have a care. Now, there are no places so thin as the moors, the wild and the windswept moors. And those are the places that are haunted by creatures like the solitary crane because they favor the moors. But there are certain people that favor those places as well. And among those people, there was a solitary beekeeper. And this beekeeper, he lived on the moors, just his horse and his beehives, and he lived in a stone cottage that he had made well with a tightly thatched roof against the fierce wind and the weather there. Now, everybody who knew him, they knew that that beekeeper's honey, it was the sweetest, his hives were the most productive. And many times they would ask him, they'd say, beekeeper, what is it about you? Do you speak their language or something? He'd say, ah, no, I don't speak the language of the bees, but, but we have an understanding, you know. I know when they're content, and I know when they're not. And we seem to get along together. Well, one day, it was in the waxing days of summer, and the beekeeper was out there working on his hives. When he saw something coming through the fields, it was coming out of the heather. It came out of the heather right into the clearing where he was working. Right to his feet it came. It was a beautiful brown hare. And the strange thing about it was it was a wild creature, but it stayed right there at his feet. And the beekeeper was a man who loved animals. And he bent down to it slowly and ever so gently. He put his hand upon its head, and it let him touch him. And that's when he noticed this hare had blue eyes. He'd never seen such a thing. But it was then that he heard this voice, and it was a voice without a dram of kindness or warmth in it. And the voice said, "'Tis mine, and you'll be giving it back now." And the beekeeper turned and he looked, and there, 20 feet away, there was a, an ancient man, and he was shaking a blackthorn cane at him in a menacing way and looking at him with eyes of menace. And as soon as that man spoke, the hare, it jumped off the ground into the beekeeper's lap. And it fairly tried to burrow itself into his, into his jacket. And the beekeeper, he made light of it, and he said, well, look at that. It, it, it appears that the, 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 the hare wants to be with me. Tis mine, I said, and you'll be giving it back now. But the beekeeper, he didn't want to give that hare to that man because there was something he didn't trust about him. But neither did he want to arouse the ire of this man, for there was something he did fear about him. But as it turned out, it was not the beekeeper, nor was it that stranger who made that decision in the end. Because just as soon as that man took a bold step towards the beekeeper, the beehives, they erupted. And bees just came flooding out of those hives. And didn't they swarm and swarm around that man? 
And they wouldn't let him move forward or backward or side to side. And there he was angrily swatting about at him. Now, they didn't touch him. They didn't sting him. But they wouldn't let him move either. And at last he said, so this is how it is now. Will you listen to me? I'll be back. I'll be back after the first frost when these bees aren't about to protect you. And I'll get what's mine. And you'll be getting what's coming to you, man. Oh, mark my words. And the beekeeper shuddered when he heard that. But then that stranger, he took a step back. And just as he did, gently eased back the bees, they, they released. And slowly they returned to the hives. And the beekeeper watched them as they did that. And then he turned back and noticed that that stranger just seemed to have melt away, melted away into the moors. Well, he, he took the, the hair then, he, he bent down, he put it on the ground, and he said, there now, the danger's past. Go on your way now. But it didn't. It stayed right there. And all afternoon, it stayed with the beekeeper as he went about his business. And then when he went to his stone cottage there, it followed him. And when he opened the door the next morning, there it was, right at the doorstep. And from that day forward, that hair was most of the time with the beekeeper. In fact, after a while, he, he took straw and put it in his own house and gave that hare a place in his own house and fed it scraps from his table. Well, time moved on, you know. And as time moved on, of course, the first frost came. And when it did, the bees, they did what they always do. They returned to the hives and they slept after that long summer of labor. And the beekeeper, well, he was as busy as he'd ever been because it was his time now to take all that honey he'd made for the summer, put it in the wagon and go from village to village and town to fair and marketplace. Now, just as there are thin places in the land, there are thin times in the year. And there is no time thinner than the time of Samhain, which we call Halloween. And you see, when thin times like Samhain come to thin places like the Moors, it is best to have a care. One afternoon, the beekeeper, he was making his way home. And what should he see in the road but a sack of feed, the kind that a horse would wear around his head, you know? Now, to most people, such a thing would mean little. But to the beekeeper, a man who loved animals, it meant that some horse somewhere wouldn't be getting his grain that night. So didn't he pick it up and put it in his own wagon? For he could tell, you see, he had fallen from a wagon. He could see the wheel ruts on either side. And didn't he take it a good mile or more past his own cut to his own house until he saw a, a camp of tinkers there, you know, people selling pots and pans? He could see one of the wagons there with a cabin on the back and a cooking fire, and sure enough, it was one of the tinkers that had lost the feed bag, and he was glad to have it back. And he said, man, you've saved my horse three nights of feed. The least I can do is feed you for one. Come with me now and, and sup with me by the fire. Well, the beekeeper, he was glad to have the warmth and the company and a nice bowl of stirabout of stew. And wasn't he eating there, talking to the tinker, when his hair, who was right in the jacket there, maybe because of the aroma of the stew, it poked its nose out, you know. And the tinker said, what have you got there? And the beaker said, ah, this, it is, it is a hare, it, it, it is mine. It, it came to me a couple of months ago from the field. And the tinker said, a hare with blue eyes. Never seen such a thing. Well, the beekeeper says, you have now, haven't you? <laughs> and the tinker says, well, I don't know if I have or not. And then he calls to the back of the wagon. He says, grandmother, grandmother, come here, take a look at this. Well, the curtain there at the back of the wagon, it, it, it opens, and out comes a woman who is as old as time. She has this wrinkled face, you see, and these gray, watery eyes. And she comes down, and she looks at this hair and gently puts her hands upon it and feels its bones, you know. How did you come by this? Well, he told her the whole tale. It came out of the heather, you see, to the clearing where I was working. And, and then this man came along to get it back. And then the bees, they fairly erupted, and they surrounded him, and they wouldn't let him come closer. 
And he said he'd be coming back to get what was his and to pay me my due. She says, beekeeper, are you? Do you speak their language? Oh, no, he said, I don't know what they're saying, but, but I know when they're happy and when they're not. Well, that's good, she said. And then she came right in front of him, and she sat right down, and she looked him right in the eye. And she took one of his hands in hers, and she said, now you listen to me, man. I'm telling you this. That stranger you met, he's not one of us. Not human, I mean. He's caught in the betwixt and the between. And the ones like that, they have a ravenous hunger and they prey upon the living and they have an unearthly power. And that creature you've got there, I don't know what it is, but it's no hair. It's some creature or someone he's bewitched or enchanted and he'll come for her, oh, he will. And there's little you can do against his power. Save for getting yourself as far away as you can on the day of Samhain because that's when he'll come for her. That's when his power is the greatest. Now, if you've a mind to keep that creature, all you can do is this. Get far away and bind it to you as tightly as you can and hold on for all your worth, for it'll try to free itself. And if the two of you are still living by morning, you may break the hold that that dark stranger has upon it. Now, the beekeeper had a rather sober ride home, you might say. And, of course, in the morning, he began to reason, you see, began to reason that perhaps it wasn't wise to lay out such risk for the sake of a mere hare. Began to reason, in fact, that after all, it was a wild creature, wasn't it? Began to reason that the best thing to do would be to go to the moors and, of course, to, to let it go in the far-flung moors, to give it its freedom. You see, he reasoned that. But, of course, the beekeeper was a human being like us. And because of that, he was far from reasonable. driven by much deeper and darker things. For it is only reason we use in the end to explain what we've done and why the bloody hell we've done it. It wasn't reason that found the beekeeper on the morning of Samhain with that hair tucked into his coat, bound to him tightly. Wasn't he there then with the sack of oat cakes and the flask with the tea and the whiskey getting into the wagon for a journey? They rode all that morning, and in the afternoon they were climbing up into the heights. And couldn't you see him now? Beneath a thin moon as the evening came, in the highest parts of the moors, riding into the deep of the night they were as far as they could go, until that horse, it came to a sudden halt. And despite the beekeeper's encouragements, it would not take another step. And then a breeze began to blow, and it was cold. And from out of nowhere, a cloud just came across the sky and blocked out the light of that thin moon. And a darkness fell like a shroud upon that beekeeper. And it was just as the grandmother said it would be. Oh, he'll come for you. And when, he's, when he does, there's little you can do against his power. For the breeze now, it became a wind, and wind became gale. And then from the sky, ice fell like knives upon that beekeeper. And the darkness, it fell so thick and heavy upon him, he couldn't see his hand in front of his face. But it would not be that howling wind. It wouldn't be that gale. It wouldn't be that ice or the darkness that would break him in the end. It was none of that. It was what he held closest to him, what he tried to protect. It was that that would break him. For whether it was a fierce wolf, a ferocious boar, a screaming banshee, he couldn't tell. All he knew was an anger. It clawed, it scratched, it bit at him, and then turned. It howled, it raged, it screeched, it wept, and it grieved. And yet he held it, and he held it, and he held it through all of that. Through that raging, wild night, he held it. And then it wasn't a creature at all. It was nothing more than fire that burned him and scalded him and scorched him. And then fire, it became ice, and it numbed him and the sharp shards of it cut through him, and yet he held through all of that. He held far past his strength, and he held in that wild night until at last he knew he could hold no more. And just in that moment when he 
let go. He felt the strength of that creature begin to wane. And ever so slightly, he could tell the wind, it, it, it began to soften. And the last thing that gentle beekeeper would remember was seeing that cloud break away from the moon and melt into the sky. It is the last thing he remembered until he awoke in that morning. He awoke to see that the light had come to the moors. And as his eyes looked around him, he saw his horse. It was gone, but, but there it was. It was grazing on the grass not far away. Someone somehow had unhitched it from the wagon. And it was then he looked up to see someone looking down at him. It was a woman, a woman who held him in her gaze with the loveliest of blue eyes he'd ever, ever seen. It was me, she said. It was me you've been protecting all this time. It was me that you held through all that raging last night. For long ago, I was taken by that dark one, and I tried to break free so, so many times. But none could or none would hold me through all of that. No one. Until you. No, the beekeeper said, it wasn't me. I'm telling you in truth now, I held as long as I could until I could hold no more. And, and it was then that I felt your strength begin to wane. It was then that the wind softened, and then the cloud broke from the moon, and that's the last I can recall. Well, all I can tell you is this, she said, the power that dark one had over me, it's broken, it's gone. Here now, she said, and she, 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 she lifted him up and she gave him to drink from the flask with the tea and the whiskey. In that blue-eyed lass, she helped the beekeeper into the wagon and they rode together all the way back to the cottage. It was after dark when they arrived. They went inside to the place together and she seemed to be familiar with the place. She found the teapot, and she hung it over the hook there, and she kindled that peat fire back to life. The two of them, you see, they were warming themselves now, drinking the tea, sitting by the fire when, when a knock came to the beekeeper's door, and he shuddered. But that last put a hand on his shoulder and said, not to worry now, not to worry. Oh, but he did worry. He was sore afraid when he got up, and afraid even more when he undid the latch to the door and terrified when he swung it open. But who should he see but the tinker man right in front of him there? It was the tinker who said, I, I thought you might want to know the news, that, that stranger, the one who menaced you with the blackthorn cane, you know, he was found today out on the moors, found by sheep herders. Oh, he was quite dead. Strangest thing was, it seems that he was stung to death by bees. <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of bees. Who would ever believe such a thing? Bees out on a cold night like that. Well, the fact of the matter was that some people did believe such a thing. And of course, many didn't because there was mystery in it. But what wasn't so mysterious was what happened a few months later, you see. Because, of course, the sun began to rise in the sky and it broke the hold that winter had on the moors. And in time, of course, the sun warmed the earth and, and it warmed the beehives along with it. And they stirred back to life. And it was out by the beehives in that time of year, the spring, that a, a wedding was held. You see, the fact of the matter was, the beekeeper, he quite fancied that blue-eyed lass, and she more than fancied him. And they said it was the loveliest, loveliest wedding you could imagine. And everyone there said the strangest thing was, the bees, they buzzed about during the whole thing. And everyone could tell you, they had never, ever seemed more contented. Well, such things do happen at thin places like the Moors, at thin times like Sawain. 
For the fact of the matter is that despite what the God science would have us believe, mystery does abound. And the darkness around us, oh, it's quite deep. And that's the tale of the blue-eyed hare. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A short tale to, to finish. Um, T.S. Eliot once said uh, that immature poets imitate. Mature poets steal. Okay? Uh, he said the only redemption for thievery, however, is to, to make something better or at least different from the page from which it was torn. You know? And that last story I told, I first heard my friend and colleague and one of my favorite storytellers, Leslie Slape, tell. And so I want you to know that that's where I learned it, and I turned it into my own version. But Leslie is a fine uh, teller of tales. And like much of us here tonight, we're sort of like blue jays and magpies, uh, always pilfering each other's nests a little bit, you know. <laughs> in Ireland, in uh, County Clare, uh, province of Munster, Munster, uh, there's four provinces in Ireland, and they all have a traditional uh, bent. Uh, Ulster... Uh, up in the north is uh, traditionally the home of warriors and warfare. It was the home of Cuchulain, the greatest of the Irish champions. Leinster in the east was the home of commerce and prosperity. It's the place of Dublin. Uh, Connaught in the west, the wild hills of Connaught, uh, is the place of knowledge and magic. Munster, the place of music and poetry. They say in Munster that for every shovel you'll find for labor, you'll find ten fiddles for pleasure. And it was there that there lived a very, very beloved healer and a wise woman and a teller of tales. Her name was Biddy Early. And they, they often called her Grandmother Biddy Early because she was an ancient woman. And it was when she was quite ancient that she was cleaning the house up one day, getting ready for an affair that night. And uh, a knock came to the door. And she opened the door. And who would it be but death? And Des said, uh, Grandmother, uh, everyone is allotted, allotted a certain time of days, a certain number of days, and your, your, your time is up now, and so uh, you'll, be, you'll be coming with me now. And she said, well, I'll be doing just that, but I'm not leaving a dirty house, you see. <laughs> I'll be putting the house in order, and when I'm done, then we'll be going together. And, she, and he said, well, no, 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 I don't think you understand, Grandmother. You'll be coming with death, and you'll be coming with me now. And she said, now, you listen to me, young man. <laughs> I've lived a long life, and I've always respected the dead. Now, I expect a little bit of respect from you, all right? Now, come into the house. Why don't you put this broom in your hands and get to work, and we'll be out of here all the sooner. <laughs> Death wasn't used to this kind of treatment, you see, but... Grandmother Biddy Early was not a woman that you wanted to argue with. And so sure enough, Death, he took the broom and began to sweep and was not accustomed to manual labor, but did the best he could. Well, he worked for a while, and then uh, Grandmother Biddy Early, she says, now, come in here, uh, for you see, uh, there's some food here to prepare. I'm not leaving it to waste. I want to cook it so someone can come along and eat it. Why don't you get over there and start cutting up the carrots, you see? Well, Death had nothing but bones for hands, and so it was difficult for him to make the cuts, you see. After a while, she said, bloody hell, you're no good to me here. I tell you what, <clears throat> go out there to the door because the guests are going to be coming soon. It's my birthday tonight, and I want you to welcome the guests as they come in to the door. I said, you want me to welcome the guests? She says, well, you're no bloody good to me here. Now get out there and do something, would you? Well, so didn't death go out to the door and open it up and... Sure enough, a, a, a couple came down the lane and up the steps, and they stopped there. And the man says to his wife, do you think we should go in? She says, I don't know. He, he seems to be smiling. He says, he's a skeleton, darling. He always looks that way. He says, well, I don't know. He doesn't seem to be posing any particular danger. And well, sure enough, they just let death welcome him in, and they came into Grandmother Biddy's place, and... And after a while, death, he welcomed everyone in, and they all came. 
And of course, the party started, and it was a grand affair. Grandmother Biddy always had wonderful parties, and this was no exception. And of course, the food was grand, and everybody was eating and talking. Death was sort of off in the corner there, you know. People didn't really know what to say, you know. But a little girl, one of Grandmother Biddy Early's granddaughters, she, she came up to death. She had a little piece of birthday cake. And she said, here, it's time to eat Grandmother Biddy's birthday cake. Well, I'm, I'm death, and I, I, I don't eat. And she said, it's birthday cake. Everybody eats birthday cake. And he says, well, all right. And, and he took it, of course, and he, and he ate. And, well, you can imagine what happened. It just, it fell right through and sort of bounced on the ribs as it made its way down. And that was sort of entertaining for the children, of course, and so... Pretty soon there was a bit of a line, you see, behind death, all ready to give him plates of food to eat. And he ate everything they gave him. He was a good sport, you know, didn't even drink the punch. And pretty soon there was a puddle at his feet and lots of food lying there. But after the meal was served, Grandmother Biddy, she loved to dance. And, of course, the fiddles came out and weren't they all playing and singing? Of course, everybody danced and, and, and death as well. Well, they brought death right in, and, and pretty soon, from the youngest of the young to the oldest of the old, everyone danced with everyone, and everyone danced with death, and death danced with everyone else. And it was a lovely evening. It went on later than any party she'd ever had. And then Grandmother Biddy and Death, they, they bid farewell to all the guests that they'd welcomed. And she said, I'm ready to go with you now. I want to thank you, Death, for being patient with me. Let me have my last birthday party. I I'm ready now. And he reached out to her and he said, you know, I haven't had such a fine time. And most people don't invite me in to parties. <laughs> they usually just run away from me. I tell you what, Grandma, I'll come back next year and see if it's time for you to go then. And she said, whatever you wish, Death, whatever you wish. And, and on his way, he went. But, you know, next year, Death came back, and it, it pretty much it was the same thing that happened the next year, save for the fact that he swept a little better and could cut the vegetables a little better, too. <laughs> and he's come back, of course, year upon year upon year. And the strange thing, too, is they say in that village, you know, the, the people are known for being so happy, so peaceful, so fearless. And some would tell you it's because from the youngest of the young to the oldest of the old, they all dance with death on a regular basis. <laughs> well, that's what Grandmother Biddy Early told me anyway. Oh, and she also wanted me to tell all of you there's another party coming up soon. <laughs> and she said, you're all invited. <laughs> and that's the tale. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Alton Chung. Alton Chung, we like to claim Alton in the Northwest as ours, but, but Alton actually has an international following, and, and he actually was born and raised in Hawaii, which makes him exotic. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Alton is very involved with the National Storytellers Network, which is a very important organization. There are actually quite a few people here who are involved with that. Um, Steve Hedinger over here, Stephen, who's been helping us with the lights and everything else. He's a, a director on the board. And I'm a representative for Oregon and Alton. Alton, early on in his storytelling career, got an award, the very, very first ever J.J. Renault Emerging Artist Award was a really big deal. And we're very proud of him. And NSN was so happy with that that they paid him back by making him chairman. Of, <laughs> so beware of gifts. <laughs> So Alton Chung will now tell us some stories. Thank you. I got a couple stories from my wife for you tonight. I say Ely Mai, you say Kako. 
Ihele mai. Ihele mai. Ihele mai. Ihele mai kako i Hawaii. That means come with me to the islands of Hawaii. See, I went grow up in a place called Kaimiki. That's one like a uh, neighborhood, like blue collar neighborhood, working class on the ever side of Diamond Head. Okay, orientation time. In Honolulu, you know, when you stand there and look at the map, the west, that's Pearl Harbor, or Ever, because Ever is the place where across Pearl Harbor, so you call it Ever. And you go the east side, that's Diamond Head. And then you get Mauka and Makai. Mauka is mountains, Makai is ocean. So, we on, Kaimaki is on the Ever side of Diamond Head. On the other side of Diamond Head is Kahala. That's where all the rich haulis go live. All the guys who come to Hawaii, they like live over there, they buy over there. So, but us guys in Kamiki, we know we get more class than people over in Palolo or Kapahulu. So we like to say we're living in Loa Kahala. <laughs> Growing up there, I get to my friend named Kyoki. Kyoki is pure Hawaiian, Hawaiian, Hawaiian kid, good fun kid. Oh, we have lots of fun. But every time Kyoki and me, we get in trouble. Now, we were going like beginning of summertime. We're going to go on one trip to the other side of the island. Oh, big expedition. So we got to go load up the car. And both Kyoki's family and my family were going to go. We had to prepare for a long trip. I was like seven, Kyoki about eight. He one year older than me. And it took us, oh, oh, 45 minutes to get to the other side of the island. Hey, what you guys laughing for? You on one island, where you gonna go? You go around the island two, three times, you know, in a couple of hours. Anyway, so we were so bored, we go fall asleep. I mean, you know, can see nothing, you know, can play with nothing, and so you know, just go fall asleep because so boring driving. Except we go wake up all of a sudden. Oh! I look over at my brother. My brother's sitting in the seat with us. He's sitting there smiling at us, going, My brother is farting. <laughs> Silent but deadly kind. Oh, man, we're going, Yeah! We die like gas chamber back there. Going, <coughs> Finally, we get to the place. Beautiful white sand beach. <coughs> Blue ocean. Just enough waves to go have fun. Because this one family trip get educational component. <laughs> my mom wouldn't plan this one. That's how, in our family, everybody salute my mom. It was just easier that way. <laughs> mom say jump, we say how high. Dad say jump, we look at him and go, okie dokie. <laughs> anyway, we all salute mom. And because it was family trip, we get educational component because right next to the place we're camping is a head out ancient Hawaiian temple. And my mom go make arrangements with the kahu, the keeper, the guy who take care of the heao, Mr. Kealoha, big Hawaiian man, come out. We're walking the trail, go up to the heao, he's telling us about the plants growing up on either side of the trail. Oh, Mr. Kealoha, he's smart. He knows all kinds of stuff about the plants. He know about the English name, the Hawaiian name, the scientific name, and he go tell us how the ancient Hawaiians would use them. Wow, we get up the hell. It's like this rectangle, built in a rectangle. Yeah, get an outer wall, get an opening in the wall. And inside, get these three stone tier platforms. Mr. K. Law telling us this one special heao. This is one war heao dedicated to the war god Ku. And they had human sacrifice when dedicating the temple. Oh, we get chicken skin. You guys call them goosebumps, we call them chicken skin. And then Mr. K. Law will tell us, hey, look, every, you know, say, we're looking at the lines. Hey, everything stays straight. Everything stays flat. Mr. K. Law said, never, you know, they just, everything, lay, hat, rock, lay it on top, rock. You know, no more cement, no more rebar. Oh, amazing. We look at all this stuff. Well, anyway, lesson pow, lesson finished. We take Mr. K. Law, huh? and me and Kyoki will run down to the beach. Oh, we spend the rest of the day having good fun time playing in the water watching the waves. And then, as the sun going down, oh, we smell the barbecue. 
Oh, dad over there, he throwing the barbecue meat, the teriyaki meat on top of the hibachi, the little grill. And then you put them on top of a plate with scoop rice, macaroni salad. Whoo, that and one strawberry soda. Whoo, that's living, I'm telling you. Wow. Anyway, the sun going down, and then they, get, they, they build bonfire on the beach. And we go roast marshmallows. Well, Kyoke, my brother, they wouldn't roast marshmallows. I wouldn't burn mine. Mine get kind of kagi, a little black. Anyway, then we make s'mores. You get the, the, the marshmallow and you get chocolate and graham crackers. Mine was not so good because I got some sand inside mine. <laughs> anyway, after that, all the adults, Kyoki's parents, my parents, they all sit around by the bonfire. They talk about adult kind of stuff. And my brother and Kyoki's sisters, they go over there, talk about other kind of stuff. Me and Kyoki, we get our flashlights. We're running along the beach chasing sand crabs with our flashlights. And then Kyoki tell me, hey, we go hey out. What? You crazy? Night time. Why? You chicken. I'm not scared. I'm not chicken. Hey, you chicken. I'm not chicken. Oh, co -co -co. Shut up. Okay, we go. Now, we know we're not supposed to go. So we turn on our flashlight, turn them off, and we walk five feet. Turn them on again. Turn them off. We get all the way up to the hey out. The corner of the head, oh. And I go, I'm looking around, I'm looking around, I'm getting all scared. Say, okay, okay, enough already. Hey, we're here already. Okay, now we gotta go back. Our parents gonna miss us. Okay, okay, go, nah. We gotta go to the entrance of the head, oh. I go, why? You're the chicken man, huh? Oh, co -co -co shut up. Okay, we go. We're going up the trail. But I'm telling you, different at night time. Get all the lava rocks, get all these holes in the lava rock. Look like eyes all looking at us. We're creeping up the thing, going up the trail. All of a sudden, I got to do number one, real bad. Going up there, I don't know, we get up to the entrance. Oh, I hopping from one foot to the other foot. I said, okay, 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 we're here, we're here. You happy now, you happy now. Okay, okay, go, nah. We got to go inside the hell. I go, Why? Shut up! Okay, we go. But you go first. Oh, now Kyoki get kind of scared. Kyoki looking around. I hopping from one foot to the other foot. Kyoki take one step inside the hell. And then this cold breeze come out of nowhere. Oh. I almost made number two in my pants right there. Kyoki, he go inside. Now, I kind of figure Kyoki just walk inside, look around, and turn around and come back. No. Kyoki go walk to the middle of the heiau. I go, whoa, what you doing? Kyoki walk. I'm going inside. I, 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 I say, scared. I don't know what to do. I go run up to him and say, okay, okay, okay. Okay, we're here, we're here. Now, 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 you happy, you happy. Now, we got to go. Kyoki go, nah. We got to get something to prove that we was here. Your brother and my sister never going to believe that we were here in the middle of the night. I'm looking around for anything that's not supposed to be there. I'm looking all over the place. And Kyoki said, come on, we got to get something. Got to pick up something. I go, what? What? What you going to get? One stone, one rock, some leaves. What? There's that thing over here. Kyoki goes, yeah, there's got to be something. He starts kicking around in the dirt. And he reached down and he pulled something up. It was a bone. Was it no chicken bone? Was curved like that. And I look at him in the flashlight. I can see the two bones have fused together. Only get one bone in the human body and it look like that. Oh, you got a piece of a human skull. I, I, I thought I was on stick. I'm sorry. Oh. We start scaring, we start freaking, I'm looking around for anything not supposed to be there. Oh man, all of a sudden I gotta make number one and number two in my pants. And all of a sudden, that's when we saw it. I tell, I tell Kiki, we gotta get out of here, we gotta get out of here. He said, no can, no can. Look, night marches. We saw this light coming up the trail. Now, night marches. Certain calendar, uh, holy days on the Hawaiian calendar, the dead march in Hawaii, along prescribed paths. Usually you see them, 
They go from Malka to Makai, from the mountains to the sea. You see them in this line of lights or this line of torches coming down the mountain to the sea. Sometimes you hear chanting. You hear the pounding of the pahu drums. That's the, that's the, the night march is telling you, get out of the way, get out of the way, we're coming. We're coming. Sometimes you're standing there, you can, the way you're standing is really hot. Still. Five feet away, you can see the grass moving like that in the breeze. That's the night marchers telling you we're coming. You don't want to be on the path when the night marchers come. That means it's going to take you to the other side. And if you do that, that's it. You foul, you finish, you muck it, you dead. Night marchers. <laughs> night marchers. Hey, we got to get out of here. No can. That's, that's the only path out of here. And Kyoki look at me and say, take off your shirt. What? Take off your shirt. I'm looking at him and saying, why? Kyoki is crying. I'm going, okay, okay, okay. I take off my shirt. I say, why are you going to take off your shirt? He says, because we, we, we take off our shirt, we act like idiots, and, and then maybe the night marchers leave us alone. The notion is, if you take off your clothes and act like an idiot, the night marchers think, hey, this one, too much trouble to take the other side. Oh, no need, no need. This one say, low, low. This one say, crazy. Leave him alone. You gotta take off your pants. You gotta take off your shirt. Okay, Kyoki is crying, so I take off my shirt. Okay, okay, take off your pants. What? Take off your pants! And that's when I heard the crunch, crunch, crunch of someone coming up the path. I took off my pants. <laughs> okay, 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 now take off your underpants. Hey, buddy, I'm not taking off my underpants from nobody. <laughs> too late, too late. Get on the ground, gravel. Say you sorry. Say you sorry. I look. And the light is there at the entrance of the hell. I look down at Kyoki. Kyoki's on the ground groveling, saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So I get on my knees. I start groveling too, saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I could hear the crunch, crunch, crunch of his footsteps as they came closer and closer. And that light, that light began coming over us. And the footsteps stopped right in front of me. And we were covered in this pool of light. Now, here we are, got these two kids in their underwear, groveling, saying, we're sorry, we're sorry, crying in this pool of light. I look at Kyoki, crying. I look up. I see these two huge Hawaiian feet like taro patch kind of feet, big feet, in these rubber slippers. I look up a little bit more, connected to these two huge legs and a pair of surfer shorts. I look up a little more, get this triple X t-shirt that says, Primo Bia. I look up a little more into the face of Mr. K. Aloha. Hey, what you boys doing over here? Nothing. How come you boys stay half naked? Lolo Kyoki's fault. He thought you was on night marcher. Night marcher? <laughs> oh, hey, boys, boys, put your clothes back on. I'll take you back to your parents. We're sorry. We could disturb the Hawaiian bones. Hawaiian bones. See, you're not supposed to disturb any kind of Hawaiian bones. You find any kind of graveyard stuff like that, you know, touch them. Bad stuff happened to you. Everybody Hawaiian know that. We, we, we disturb Hawaiian bones. Hawaiian bones. Mr. Kealoa grabbed the bone. He looked at him in the flashlight. Look real good. Ah, yeah, boys. Well, you're not going to die tonight. Well. Kind of depends upon your parents, but uh, this is not one human bone. This one turtle shell. Ancient Hawaiians go use them as one scoop or one spoon. There, I take you back to your parents. So Mr. Kelo took us back and he told the story to our parents. My father laughed so hard he fell out of his chair. <laughs> Kyoki's parents, my mother, they're laughing so much, they're crying. My brother laughed so much he farted again. Would have been funny, huh? 
except every weekend for the rest of that summer, either Kyoki's parents or my parents would drive us to the other side of the island to stay with Mr. K. Aloha. And we would pull weeds, rake leaves, water the plants, and listen to his stories. Wasn't the last time Kyoki would get me in trouble. But it was probably the best summer we ever had. <laughs> you know, in Hawaii, we get saying, you got to treat all women with respect. Because you never know which one might be Pele. Pele, the goddess of the volcano, the goddess of fire. Pele, she's kind of the, a minor deity in the pantheon of Hawaiian gods, but she's the one who has taken the most interest in human affairs. She's the one who's still seen in the islands today. Pele, she got so much mana, she got so much power that she can transform herself into a beautiful wahine, a beautiful young girl. Or she can transform herself into a wrinkled up old crone. Or she can transform herself into a pillar of fire. One day, Pele was walking around the big island of Hawaii. Oh, she loved the aina. She loved the land, and she loved the people too. She passing by this one valley. She heard all this yelling and all this cheering. Pele looked inside the valley. Oh, it's a halua sled race. Oh, halua sleds. This is the kind of sleds made in Hawaii, for, made for run on grass, because we don't want enough snow. They kind of like get two polished wooden runners, kind of curved in the front up like that. Runners about four inches wide between them in the front, about six inches wide in the back, and all these cross pieces holding them together. Got these two handles with this piece of copper cloth stretched between. And what you do is you run to the crest of one hill, and you grab that halua sled, you hold them to your chest, and you go down the other side, head first, about six inches above the ground. Halua sled racing, oh, that's Pele's most favorite spot. So Pele, she go hele and she go all the way back to Kilauea, back to her own home to get her own halua sled. By the time she come back, it's that championship run. We're going to figure out who the bestest of the bestest, who the best halua sled racer in all of the islands. Down to these two chiefs, these two ali'i. One named Ka'avale, one named Ahua. Both these guys stay young. Both these guys stay strong. Both these guys get testosterone poisoning. They're standing up there, looking down at the course, and all of a sudden they realize, hey, right between them is a beautiful wahine with her own halua sled. Oh. A hua go, hui, hui, hey, little girl, little girl. Better step aside, little girl. Bombay, you're going to get hurt. Bombay, that's Hawaiian slang for later on. Bombay, you're going to get hurt. Kaavala, he's all arrogant. He go, ha, a ole pelekia. No trouble, we're going to leave him in the dust anyway. Then a hua realized, hey, this wahine, she's beautiful. Hey, little girl, hey, if I win, you're going to give me one kiss. Mwah. Girl, don't pay attention. Just look at the course. And then the referee come up and say, you guys ready? Ikahi. Ilua. Ekolu. And these two chiefs go run to the crest of the hill. They grab the hulua sleds. They hold them to the chest. They go down the other side. Down, flying down the grassy slope. It's both Ahua and Ka'avale. Flying down the hill. Going down neck and neck. And all of a sudden, right between them. Choo! What was that? I don't know. <laughs> they get down to the finish line. And there's the wahine sitting there, playing with her hair, as if she's been waiting for them all day long. Ho, oh, Kaavali going, he's so arrogant. He goes, whoa, hey, that was beginner's luck. I like one rematch. The lady look at him go, shoot. Shoot. That's Hawaiian slang for okie dokie. So Ahua go, look at this lady. He said, something funny about this lady. Tell you what, you guys go ahead. I go and watch this lady as she comes down the course. Oh, Ka'avala, he goes storming up the hill. He all hoo hoo, he all angry. Everybody get out of his way, which was good. Because when he get up to the top, go find a puhaku, a rock, wrap him in kapa cloth, stuff him in the front part of his sled. Because he know the heavier the front part of the sled, the faster you're going to go. By that time, everybody else came up the hill. Get the wahine, get him, and there is the, the, the referee come up and say, You guys ready? Ikahi, Ilua. 
Hey, Kolu! And they run to the crest of the hill. And Carvalho grabs his sled. He goes flying down the front of the hill. He's flying down the hill. Never goes so fast in all his life. His hair is flying up. His ears, they're tearing up. His lips going. <laughs> Never goes so fast in all his life. No matter what the way he needs to, Shinoke can catch up. But he, he's out distance, so no problem. He gets down to the finish line. Everybody's saying, yelling. Everybody's cheering. And Carvalho, he's so arrogant. He goes, yeah, I know. I know. I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. And he noticed Ahua, who was standing there going, what you doing, bro? Catching flies. And he looked at Ahua, and he turned around, and what he see, make his hair turn white, because coming down the mountain is huge wave of molten rock, of lava. And using her lower sled like one surfboard is the wahine. But she's not the pretty wahine anymore. Oh, no. Her body stay on fire. Her hair stay white. Her eyes stay black coals and smoke coming out the back of her head. She going, ah, come here, boys. Carvalho go, whoa, it's Pele. We got to go to the beach. We get to the beach. We can be safe. They grab Ahua and both of them start running to the beach. In the meantime, this huge wall of lava is coming down the hill, touches the trees. The trees catch on fire, touches the houses. The houses burst into flames. All the rocks are shattering and there's this ground is trembling around. You can smell that smell of sulfur. This huge wave of lava comes and washes over the people and that's it. Pow, finish, make, dead. Meantime, the two chiefs are running down the beach. There's Ahua and there's Kavali. They're running, running, running. And there's a huge wave of lava with the wahine coming down after them going, yeah. <laughs> Come here, boys. They reach the beach. Ahua, he stepped on that soft sand. Boom, he trippy fall. Boom, face splat. He tried to get up too late. Ho Pele is right there saying, Oh, boy, you like wind so much. You want me to give you one kiss? I give you one kiss right now. And she wrapped her arms around him. And the lava come and covered him. Kaavali see that he goes, wah! He goes running to the beach. He's jumped, he's stretched out, his fingertips just touching the water. And that's when Pele grab him by the ankle, pull him back on shore and say, hey boy, you gotta you wanna win so much, you gotta go cheat, huh? Eh? Ah, I tell you what, I give you a victory hug right now. She wrap her arms around him and the water lava come on top of him. On the south side of the big island of Hawaii. Got these two big black stones right there on the beach. They call them, old timers call them the Pu'u or Pele, the hills of Pele. One they call Ka'avale, one they call Ohua. And I tell you this story. Tell you all you old men out there and all you young men out there, you got to treat all women with respect because you never know which one might be a goddess. Anne Louise Sterry. Now, Anne Louise Sterry often comes with her Aunt Lena. So you get two storytellers for the price of one. Now, when I was first at Stories by the Sea in Newport, everyone talked about Anne Louise, but I actually didn't meet Anne Louise first. I met Aunt Lena first in the bathroom. <laughs> where I'd gone because I was absolutely panicked because suddenly I was going to get to tell a story that I was sure I'd forgotten. So I ran into the bathroom, and there was this woman in a polka dot dress with wild glasses and really big bosoms. <laughs> and she said, what's up, doll? What's wrong? And she grabbed me in a hug, and she was nurturing and kind like all storytellers are, and it was Aunt Lena. She made me feel good. And I know that both Aunt Louise and Aunt Lena will make you feel good tonight. A long time ago, far away, over the hills, over the mountains, through the mist by the side of the lake, there was a beautiful young maiden. Actually, no, I take it all back. No, no. It wasn't a long time ago. It was just a couple of years ago. And it wasn't far away. It was on the Oregon coast, quite close to here. And it wasn't a young maiden. It was an averagely attractive middle-aged woman. <laughs> Myself. <laughs> that this story is about. And actually, I thought about it not so long ago. You know, if something happened to me now, 
They would not describe me in the newspaper as a beautiful young woman was in a car accident. They'd say a chubby senior citizen was in a car accident. I mean, think about how they might describe you. It's kind of, you know, kind of puts you off a little bit when you think about that. Anyway, enough of that. I was driving down the coast in August thinking I was going to have a lovely day at the beach, as you can do in Oregon in August, right? And I was driving my car, and I was drinking my coffee, and I was so happy, and I had the radio on, and I was singing under the boardwalk, feeling so good, thinking what a great life I had, what a great day it was going to be, and it started to rain, which is kind of unexpected, in Oregon in August on the coast, and it started to rain really hard. And I have to tell you, I went from, what a wonderful day this is, right down the funnel of despair in about 30 seconds. <laughs> Thinking to myself, why did I ever marry that man? <laughs> and then we had those darn three children. What was I thinking? <laughs> Besides that, between the rain on the roof and all the coffee I had been drinking, it occurred to me I needed to find a rest stop. And I had just passed one, and so I started driving faster because I knew if I didn't get somewhere soon, I was going to be in big trouble. I passed a gas station. But you probably know, like I do, I learned this from my grandmother a long time ago, you get pregnant from gas station bathrooms. <laughs> You know, don't you? See, you all know. It's, it's like common knowledge. So I kept driving. I didn't want to stop there. I was getting really uncomfortable, and then I saw it. The red sign of my salvation, Fred Myers. I knew they had what was on my list that day. I went straight into the ladies' room where only one stall was taken. I could see a pair of little of green sneakers underneath. And so I went to the handicap stall. Because, you know, at my age, sometimes you need a little room. And I figured I would be in and out so quick. If anybody came in needing the handicap stall, it would be OK. So I'm settling myself down. And from the other stall, a little voice says, hi, how are you? Now, I'm thinking they can't be talking to me because I don't know who that is. They don't know who I am. I don't say anything. The voice comes again. Hi, how are you? And I'm thinking to myself, gosh, in New Jersey where I come from, we don't talk to strangers in bathrooms. No, no, no. In fact, we don't even talk to our friends in public toilets. And actually, speaking in a public toilet to a stranger could be considered an act of aggression. So I didn't say anything. But the voice came again, hi, how are you? And then I remembered, of course, I'm from the East Coast, and we really have a bad reputation of being unfriendly, and people in Oregon are friendly. So I said, hi, I'm fine. Silence. So I get myself organized, sort of back in the funnel of despair, because it's still raining. I hear the toilet flush, and then the little pitter-patter of feet, and then the water turning on, and I'm sort of in a daydream, and the voice comes again. Hey, are you still there? I'm thinking this can't really be happening, can it? And the voice keeps saying, hey, are you still there? I mean, finally I said, yes, I'm here. And two seconds later, under my bathroom door, sliding on its back, comes a kid with blonde hair. And it looks up at me and it says, hi, I'm wearing Superman underwear today. And it pulls out its shorts to show me its underwear. It's a little boy. He has blonde hair. And I stare at him and I don't know what to say. And I can see he's staring at me because draped around my ankles are my nice big white underwear. <laughs> I could only imagine what he must be thinking. <laughs> Fortunately, before I have to speak, 
the big bathroom door opens and a woman's voice says, Timmy, come on, we got to go. And the kid waves to me, bye, and he slides back out from under the door and off he goes. And I sit there in stunned silence. Not usual for me. <laughs> if you know me, you'll know that. And I thought, gosh, people really are friendly here in Oregon. Suddenly, I started laughing. I couldn't stop. I mean, what, what a random act of kindness that this little boy would slide under my bathroom stall and take me from the doom, the funnel of despair, right back up onto the, into the sunshine, leaping out into the sand and feeling so happy. So I think to myself, if underwear could make this kid happy, I'm going to go see what they have at Freddy's for people my age. <laughs> Do they have super women underwear, super woman underwear, or something like that? Maybe Barbie doll. I'll even go for Barbie doll. Well, as I'm walking toward the underwear apartment, coming from the other direction is little Timmy with the woman. I guess it's his mother. She's pushing a shopping cart, and there's a baby in the shopping cart. And I have a big smile on my face because I want to tell Timmy's mother what an amazing kid he is and that he changed my day. I was also thinking that I might ask her, like, is this something they teach kids in school on the Oregon coast? You know, <laughs> slide under old ladies' bathroom doors. I'm from New Jersey. I didn't know. Anyway, I'm walking towards him with this big smile, and Timmy walks right past me. I'm thinking he didn't recognize me in the upright position. <laughs> but I did not let that stop me. I went into the lingerie department, searching through all the shelves for some super person underwear. Of course, they don't have that in my size, so I had to settle for these. I had to settle for these. <laughs> they were kind of bright and cute, I thought to myself. And every time I try to get into them, it reminds me of Timmy and his Superman underwear. And I thought to myself, such ordinary things can bring us so much joy, can't they? Now, this was not always the way for me and my family. I grew up in a big Italian family in northern New Jersey. And here's the thing about that. In our family, you weren't allowed to talk about all the good things you were, that were happening to you because if you did, somebody might give you the maluka, the evil eye. So you had to keep that to yourself. So if something good happened, the old great aunts would say, don't tell anybody. Now, you might wonder how you can figure out how somebody can give you the evil eye. So I'm going to tell you. Don't look at the person next to you while I tell you this. No, don't look. Don't look. Don't look. Okay. If they have eyebrows that go straight across, don't look. They have the power to give you the evil eyes. Okay? If they have one eye of one color, and one eye of another color, don't look. And certainly don't look at the people behind you. They have the power to give you the evil eye. So those are the kind of people you have to watch out for and make sure you don't tell them anything good that's going on in your life. That's what we learned when we were kids. And, and here's, you want to know how, you really want to know how you know if somebody has given you the evil eye. If you're feeling like bad things are happening to you, put some water in a little saucer and then take an eyedropper and drop a drop of olive oil there, okay? If it stays right in the center, you're safe. But if the olive oil spreads out in rings, it means you have been cursed with the evil eye. <laughs> of course, you probably want to know how you get rid of the curse, and that's for another whole, that's for another whole section. We're not going to talk about that today. You can see me after privately for that. But they used to tell us those kinds of things. And we grew up like that. So we grew up with a lot of kind of complaining and hiding your joy. And then they told us other random things. Like, I'll never forget when my, one of my great aunts pulled me aside and she said, when it's that time of month, never touch a plant. You can kill it. <laughs> I did not even know what that time of month was. <laughs> but I knew that this was the kind of secret you couldn't share with your mother. I knew this was the kind of secret you could just had to keep inside yourself. 
When I got to figure out what that time of month was, I thought, well, I have the one brother. I'm wondering if it works. <laughs> Didn't. Didn't. But I, but I do remember, I do remember when I was in high school in a poetry class and we had to make a list poem, like, you know, a list of, you know, things I love about Christmas or, you know, things I like about Thanksgiving. My list poem was this, plants I have killed. <laughs> it was a very, very long list. So that's how I grew up, with more complaining than acknowledging pieces of joy. But I had the one great aunt, you know, these great aunts and, and, and all this a big Italian family, they were immersed in this culture, in this kind of superstition, in this actually these things were things that were supposed to keep us safe and keep us close because we, our family was, were peasants in Italy and you didn't want the rich people to know because those were the ones that would give you the evil eye or take away the good things that had happened to you. So they were really trying to keep us safe, but there were some of the ants who actually tried to break out from those bounds. And I brought one of those with me tonight. This is Aunt Lena. Now, Aunt Lena, well, I mean, Aunt Lena was sort of an amazing woman in some ways. She was very loud and very obnoxious. And in fact, when I was too loud and obnoxious, my father would say, don't be like your Aunt Lena. You know what I mean? But she, <laughs> but they dressed, you know, they dressed in a certain way. They always dressed in a certain, they always wore their fancy shoes. And of course, they never pulled their stockings up because that was, yeah. And they had always their muldans on underneath. <laughs> Must be why I had, the, I had those other big white ones, you know what I mean? And they wore a ton, a ton, a ton of jewelry because they almost clanked when they walked. I was very attracted to that as a child. You know, young girls are kind of attracted to these things. And then, of course, they had their special glasses that they wore, like that, yeah. <laughs> and something else about them, they wore red lipstick at all times, and they put it on without a mirror, <laughs> like this right? You do this, don't you? She recognized it. It's her family. It's her family. I can't believe it. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah your mother looks like this, right? Yeah. Mm. And then if it would go on your teeth, they would go, is it on my teeth dolls? And they would wash it off like that. Yeah. Mm. And so all of them look like this, Aunt Lena, all the rest of them. And then they had some other interesting things that we didn't really talk about, but we just observed when we were kids. They had unusual facial hair, of course. <laughs> Yeah, right? Yeah, they got product for this now. They had beauty marks on one side or on the other. You never knew. And they, of course, they always wore their white gloves when they went out because they wanted to look really fancy. And they kept their hands nice by chicken fat, right? They're saying, yes, yeah, see, you use it probably here in Oregon. Chicken fat, it keeps your hands nice and soft. So first you put the fat on your hands, then you cook the chicken. It's very economical. That's what, yeah, very economical. Now, something, there was something I wanted to tell you that just went right inside of one my mind and outside the other. I can't remember what that is, but that's okay. It will come to me. So here we are. Hi, dolls. I'm Ann Louise's great Aunt Lena. I remember now what it was she was going to tell you. I can see it in your faces. Some of you ladies, you're a little pale. You need the red lipstick. I could pass it around. <laughs> because it's like the communion cup. You don't get germs from lipstick. Yeah. <laughs> just like the communion cup. Now, it will brighten you up if you want to try. I'll just toss it to the audience. Raise your hand. No, nobody's going to. Way in the back there. Come on down here. I'll give, up here. I'll give you a little kiss. She's like, no, I'm not going to do it. All right. Here's what I want to tell you. All right. Ann Louise is talking about the little boy, Timmy Wright, who, who made her feel good. So here's what I learned. You gotta find little pieces of things 
in your life that make you feel good and put them in your life, you're going to have more joy, okay? You're going to have more audacious joy, dare I say. So I want to tell you a little story about something I put in my life to bring me more joy, which is why I'm so happy, just like this. But first, I forgot my hat. A lady never goes without her hat. Yes, yeah, sorry, yeah. All right, here we go. Sorry, okay, yeah. Now, because I got it. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You Italian, doll? Are you Italian? Or oh, she is. Yes, she knows. She knows. Okay, anyway. So here's the thing. You want to know what's going to make you happy and bring you some joy? You think about what you wanted to be when you were a little kid. I read that in a book somewhere at the doctor's office. So what did you want to be when you were a little kid? When I was a little kid, of course, I wanted to be a dancer. I mean, with legs like these, are we surprised? <laughs> of course, I wanted to be a dancer. So between my second husband and my third husband, I thought I'll take some dancing lessons. Now, which kind should I do? Well, one day, a young friend of mine is talking to me. She says, Anne Louise, I'm teaching pole dancing classes. <laughs> They're very good for you because you need a lot of strength in your upper body to do it, and it makes you feel good as a woman. I thought, well, I feel good as a woman, but I'll take these classes anyway. It would be fun. I'm going to tell you about this, how I put this little fun thing in my life. So I go to the class. You know where it is? It's right down near Amzi. You know where that is here in Portland, right? They have these old industrial buildings. Well, in one of those buildings, there's a pole. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where I went. <laughs> so it's a classroom with a pole in the middle, and it's all painted red. And you go in, and you pay your $10, and the teacher says, here are your pole dancing shoes. And she gives you a pair of shoes with heels about that high. And then the next, and I mean, I wear fancy shoes, but they were a little high for me. And then the next thing she says is, now you've got to choose your pole dancing name. You probably want to know how you do that, right? Because you're thinking right now, I'm going to classes. I can see it in your eyes. Boys can do pole dancing too, you know. Yeah. Okay. So here's how you choose your pole dancing name. The name of your first pet and the name of the first street you lived on. Put those together, that's your pole dancing name. Anybody have it in their head right now? Tell me, go ahead, what's yours? Oh, it's a good one, I can tell. Go ahead, shout it out, doll. Butter Park. Butter, oh, Butter Park, that's a perfect pole dancing name. I love it. Who else has got one? She's whispering in the ear of the guy. All right, tell me yours, it's going to be good. I can Look, she can't even stop laughing. What's yours, doll? Goldie Bourbon. See, it's so easy. You can make it. your name. Like anybody up there in the top want to say? Anybody? Men up there? Looks like a whole bunch of men up there. Oh, boy. Anybody want to tell me their pole dancing name up there? Oh, this lady in the back. Okay, go ahead. Tell me. You. Sally Billet. Sally Billet. Yes, absolutely. Now, here's what I have to tell you. I was living on 14th Street, which doesn't really have the ring of a pole dancing name. <laughs> so... I figured I would be Lena Luscious. <laughs> that would be my pole dancing name. So once we got that squared away, we spent about a half hour doing exercises, push-ups and core exercises to keep us nice and firm, and yoga moves. We were all doing yoga moves. Now, all the other girls in the class were in their little skinny exercise clothes, and I was dressed like this because this is comfortable, and I thought it kind of looked nice. Anyway, so we're doing all this, and then... She says, before we approach the pole, we have to learn to do our sexy walk. And she has us each walking across the room doing our sexy walk. I'm thinking, this is a piece of cake for me, my sexy walk. So I start walking across the room doing my sexy walk. I get to the other side. She says, I think you should try that again. I swing my pocketbook to the other arm. I put my pole dancing shoes on, I try again. My sexy walk. It's slow, she said, be sensuous. I'm sensuous, slow, 
it's very hard in the high heels, I can tell you that. Okay, she has me going back and forth and back and forth. I'm the only one who has to do it so many times, I figure she likes it because I'm so good at it, I don't know. And then she says, now, get in a line and you gotta approach the pole one at a time in your sexy walk. When you get there, throw yourself onto the pole, wrap your legs around, slide down while you strike a pose. Right there, too many directions at one time. <laughs> I couldn't process, okay? So let's just start with the sexy walk, get to the pole. So I do my sexy walk. I get to the pole, I throw my knee around. I'm trying to get the other knee around. I try to grab on, I fall splat down to the floor. It was like that every week for four weeks. I never could get hanging onto that pole. It was way too slippery, I think, <laughs> for me. <laughs> but I would strike a pose at the bottom, tipping my head back while I laid in a heap at the floor. I felt so happy. I was bringing joy to my life. After four weeks, I thought, enough with the joy. I'm done with the pole dancing, OK? Maybe next time I'll try belly dancing, because I got the belly, you know? I got the legs, I got the belly. Any of those little kinds of things are the way you can put joy in your life. Now, I'm thinking right now, Yous are going to go home, and you're thinking of ways to put joy in your life right now, right? A bit of bing, a bit of bang. It's going to be a good night, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I can give you the address of the pole place. It's not that far away. You can leave here and go right there. <laughs> so that's what I mostly wanted to tell you about. Now, turns out I got five more minutes. Can you believe? <laughs> Well, actually, only three, because i got to do something in two. So I'm going to tell you a little story that I don't usually get to tell. It's like a one minute and ten second story. You ready? It's called, let me think now, what is it called? Hmm. Beeping Slooty. Okay, you with me? Sometimes Oregon audiences are a little slow. <laughs> <laughs> You're probably still thinking about the pole, right? And you can't get over my sexy walk, but okay. Beeping Slooty. Once upon a wine, there was a bee wavy. Now, <laughs> the fed berries came and said when she tweeches the wage at empty, she will frick her finger upon a spindle and die. Oh, no, 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 said the foot berries. When she tweeches the wage at empty, she may frick her finger, but she will not spy. She will merely doll into a fleet seep. <laughs> These are the kind of stories we tell in Italy when we have nothing to do, you know what I mean? <laughs> in the barn, around the hay mounds. This is what we do in Italy. Okay, where was I? Okay, she was going to doll into a fleet seep. Okay, okay. Lever the nest. Her caddy the ding was fully sexed. Fully sexed? Sorely vexed. Fully sexed. <gasps> and ordered all the spinning... The kinning wheels in the bingdom kerned. The pavli lincess ugrup happily. One day she was pondering around the wallis and she spied a wuggly old itch spitting and sinning at a dindle. <laughs> she heached out her rand and fricked her finger. Well, is it no quick as a wink? She dell into a fleep seep, and all the poldries in the slalis lella peep too. <laughs> Here's the very Italian part. Outside a horny thread, ugrup. <laughs> Pime test, and no one could penetrate the porns <laughs> until. One day, lighting a wrong, came a hung and pransom yince. <laughs> That's my favorite part. <laughs> of course, I'm looking for husband number four, you know what I mean? A hung and pransom. With a fudge of his tinger, the porn started. He spied the Pavli Linces 
sleeping. And he lissed her upon the kips. <laughs> and she smoke up whiling. <laughs> and so they were parried in the malice and hid lapidly ever after. And that's the end of that little story. <laughs> Thank you, dolls. So, you know, if any of you guys, I see a lot of men here. You know, I'm looking for husband number four. You know, anybody want to have interviews after, I could make myself available. <laughs> now, here's the thing. All of this storytelling, being together, making the community, being joyful at the bottom line, it's all about love. So we're going to sing a song about love. And to do this, I brought my accordion because what's a night of storytelling without an accordion, right? You know what I mean? Here we go. I brought my nice accordion and I'm thinking we're going to sing a song that we all know called That's Amore. Right? Okay. Now, if you don't know the words, you know the melody, you could just sing La La. Okay? Because La La is as good as words. And here's what happens when you do that. Your brain releases endorphins. Swirling around, they make you feel so good. So you're going to leave here. You're going to feel so good. A bit of bang, a bit of bing. You're going to go home. It's going to be a great night. <laughs> so I'm going to ask those other cute boys to come up here, those ones that were telling stories. That one's married, Dawn. That one's married, Dawn. I got that one. He's not married. OK, here we go. We're all going to sing together. Now, you could like hold your lighters up. You'll sway back and forth like we're at a rock concert. Hi, dolls. Come on, dolls. These are awesome. Here we go. And you're going to play your, your guitar? No, no, I don't know. No? i got to read the words. I don't He's going to read the words. OK. He's going to read the words. OK. All right. You are going to love. We're going to sway back and forth. And you are going to sing, right? Isn't this so cute? When the moon hits your eye like a big pizza pie, that's amore. When the world seems to shine like you've had too much wine, that's amore. Bells will ring, ting-a-ling-a-ling, ting-a-ling-a-ling, and you'll say Vita Bella. Hearts will play tippy tippy tay, tippy tippy tay, like a gay child in Tella. Lucky fella, when the stars make you drool, just like pasta bazoo, that's a more When you walk down the street with your feet on a cloud, you're in love. Here's a big finish. When you walk in a dream and you know you're not dreaming, Signore, excuse me, but you see back in Napoli, that's amore. Sing that line one more time. Excuse me, but you see back in old Napoli, that's Amore. Bravo, 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 bravo. Bravo, take a bow. Bravo.